Over 4,000 years ago, the inhabitants of the Yellow River Valley in China were faced with massive floods that threatened to destroy civilization as they knew it. The fabled Yu the Great was given the Luoshu diagram on the shell of a tortoise to control the floods. It's said that Yu the Great then danced the mystical pattern of steps based on the Luo diagram called the Lu Bu, which divided the land from the waters and returned order to the world. But Yu the Great had danced the Lu Bu in a very particular way. He had done it only after transforming into a bear. In the previous episode, I gave a short history of how I came to find the Hong Kong style and perform it for over 15 years. And when I was chosen to do motion capture for Kratos in the 2018 God of War, I had to break a 15 year habit so that I could move in an entirely new way, an American way. I'll get into that process in a later episode, but in this episode, we're gonna tackle Chinese martial arts and warfare, and the next episode we'll discuss the Chinese opera and secret societies because it's a huge topic and needs two episodes, while always looking at the unique blend of religion and sorcery that binds it all together to get at the origin of the Hong Kong and Chinese movement style. Chinese martial arts as an entire system is about as diverse as all martial arts systems taken as a whole, but the main martial art aesthetics we see in the Hong Kong style boil down to cold weapon styles, empty handed styles, animal styles, which is a subgenre of empty handed styles, and lastly, hot weapons or firearms and pyrotechnics. Cold weaponry includes military weapons made for warfare, the main ones being broadsword, staff, straight sword, and spear. Cold weapons were also anything that peasants could get their hands on and use when being drafted for war. A lot of the time, these were simple farm tools, such as the trident and the spade, which are still taught in Chinese martial arts schools today. Although, as a side note, it's possible that these farm tools might have begun as weapons of war and then became farm tools. Many of these weapon sets conform to divination symbols like the eight trigrams, which places emphasis on footwork hitting certain marks. This lends to a highly dynamic vocabulary of angles and footwork that you can still see in contemporary wushu. One of my favorite examples of this is Yu Chung Hui, who is the swordsman from all three Shaolin Temple movies. Man, look at this guy move. The transition from sacred implement into tools for medicine, farming, warfare, calligraphy, or any other trade is known as technics. It's a trademark feature of Kung Fu weaponry. Whether a tool is used for violence or for peace all depends on how you use it. So when it comes to Chinese weapons, there's a built-in opportunity for improvisation. And so we get a very stream of consciousness aesthetic. We get Sammo Hung's comedic transition from divining implement to combat and back again. Lao Galerung's Kung Fu history lesson demonstrating the transition from farm tools to weapon and back again. And of course, Jackie Chan's use of modern technology as defensive weapons and back again. You know, a weapon was a pretty expensive thing. And it's one of the reasons why you see like so many farming tools being used because farmers just had like their hoe, you know, or just a limited amount of tools. They didn't have the budget to get a nice sword, you know, and that's what they knew how to use. So they just, you know, instead of digging pros in the ground, they learned how to dig pros in people's heads. They always talk about classically the 18 weapons in Chinese martial arts, which is more of an auspicious number than it is a real number. When you start getting into the forms of these exotic weapons, and finding out this makes sense, you know, yeah, this is how you would use this weird tiger hook or this chain whip. That there's just some embedded wisdom in there that I think uh, is incredibly valuable. Now, while there is some legacy of real sparring competitions using swords during the reign of Tang Emperor Taizong, most traditional Chinese weapon sparring is choreographed. These serve a dual function of exercise and kata, although I think it's possible some of these routines in these original forms might have served more of a sacred function, which I'm gonna cover in greater detail in the animal style section later. Overall, the variety of cold Chinese weapons and the techniques inherent within them with their choreographed weapon sparring routines all lend to a complex aesthetic that is unique to Chinese and Hong Kong martial arts cinema. Moving on to the empty-handed martial arts systems, they come in many, many different varieties. Internal styles like Taiji Chuan and Xing Yi utilize the eight trigrams, the five elements, 12 animals, and various other sacred symbols to root the practitioner in a system of magic. It's a hodgepodge of Taoism, Buddhism, and, well, Egg Shen put it best. Of course the Chinese mix everything up. <laughs> There's Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoist alchemy and sorcery. We take what we want and leave the rest. Just like your salad bar. 
The aesthetics of these internal styles are as esoteric as their roots. The footwork which traverses the trigrams, the transitions between the five elements, and the seemingly supernatural feats that one can accomplish thanks to the cultivation of chi emphasized with wirework. All of these internal styles were practiced by clans who made their own family versions. Chen style Taiji Chuen comes from Chen Wanting, and then it was simplified by Yang Luchan into Yang style Taiji Chuen. Northern empty-handed styles, broadly speaking, have the long flowing movements that we see in contemporary Wushu, and you can also see this in older systems like Tan Tui. And broad general systems like Long Fist are highly aesthetic as well. After 1978, when Deng Xiaoping opened trade with Hong Kong again, action stars like Jet Li and Yu Rong Guang exploded onto the action film scene using these northern styles, which led to some amazing mainland Hong Kong co-productions like Mirage and Martial Arts of Shaolin. And just like internal styles, the northern empty-handed styles have their own family sub-styles as well, such as Tong Bei, which has a chi variety created by Chi Tai Chang. Again, many of these were kept and developed within family clan systems for generations. Overall, the northern style movement adds a very stylistic element to Hong Kong films. Although often these supposedly northern style kicking characters played by actors like John Liu were actually just doing Taekwondo. By contrast, the southern external systems like Hong Chun, Wing Chun, and Choi Li Foot have a very different flavor. Movements are punchier, less flowy, and the angles are tighter. Hand movements are more subtle. The theory is that the bigger, more flowy northern style of movement comes from the flatter, more open geography of northern China, and that the punchier southern Chinese style movements came about due to the hilly and wooded geography of the south. I never really bought this argument. I can understand the logic, but I can't quite understand why a wooded area would have that much of an effect on an entire region's movement style. There are also woods in the north, so did people just not develop martial arts styles there? And if the southern wooded areas produced a more condensed movement style, then why would they have a staff? Because using a staff in a tight environment seems like a really bad idea. So I can't help but wonder if the bigger northern style movements are actually more of a function of being closer to the capital, Beijing, which was not only the heart of Chinese opera, but also the seat of military authority. And so martial systems in the north are perhaps visually less militant and more disciplined out of deference to the state. While the southern style's relative distance from Beijing allowed them to maintain a more raw edge, they just weren't as concerned about drawing unwanted attention, not until the Qing dynasty anyway. If anything, these southern systems might have actually benefited from their rawness because it gave them a level of legitimacy that the northern styles might have lacked. Kind of like Krav Maga. No nonsense, no concern about the authorities watching you and wondering if you're a threat to the government. Under this kind of environment, northern styles would have a different incentive when drawing in new students because this kind of movement naturally plays better in the marketplace. This is not to say that the northern styles were less practical than the southern systems, but again, their proximity to the capital might have necessitated that they present themselves like exercises in gymnastics, but over time, the student would come to understand the true meaning of these aesthetics in order to apply them to actual combat in a very deep way. Wax on, wax off. Don't forget to breathe. Very important. Now, regarding the generally low quality and quantity of sparring within Chinese systems, the reasoning goes that you can't really spar with these arts. And that's fair, especially if your art has eye pokes, groin kicks, and weapons. And frankly, the legacy of Hong Kong and Chinese choreography is less concerned with sparring techniques and more concerned with tradition, aesthetics, and cooperation. It's also worth mentioning Sanda, which is a uniquely Chinese blend of wrestling and kickboxing, but the aesthetics of it are a lot like Muay Thai and Western kickboxing, but you don't really see much Sanda in Hong Kong and Chinese productions until the 2000s after MMA really started taking off. But before this, there were plenty of kickboxers in Hong Kong films such as Billy Chow and Ben Yurkita's. But perhaps the most esoteric of all these martial arts are the animal styles. Whether there are real animals like monkey, snake, and mantis, mythical animals like the dragon or phoenix, or systems that combine animal styles together, like the tiger crane system of Hong Kun, or the eight animals of Bagua, 
Animal martial arts styles of all kinds are some of the most unique, and I'm going to keep saying the word aesthetic, elements of Hong Kong and Chinese action cinema. Now, the conventional wisdom says that these animal styles were developed by kung fu masters who were inspired by animal combat and applied this wisdom of creation to their own animal systems. Wang Lung was inspired by a praying mantis catching a cicada, Yong Chun studied a crane, and the monk Fa Cheng used eagle techniques to beat Liu Shijun. <laughs> Sorry, I'm terrible with these names. Some of these animals, like tiger, make a lot of sense because tigers fight pretty hard, but in general, real life animal techniques are. Well, they're not exactly pretty. So we have to at least credit these martial arts systems for making ugly animal combat look so good. And judging by our favorite martial art movies, China really seems to have something of a monopoly on animal styles. But it turns out that China is not entirely alone here. There are other animal-based systems in the world. Lots of them, actually. Native Americans had eagle and bear dances among their many animal systems. India had the monkey dance of Hanuman. Africa has the panther dance. Australian Aborigines have emus, ostriches, kangaroos, eagles. Native societies everywhere in the world throughout history have had these animal movement systems, but primarily in the form of dance. These dances on the one hand served as a demonstration of membership in these animal clans, kind of like a secret handshake. Only initiates could learn the dances, and only genetic clan members could become initiates, at least in their original forms. And it turns out many Chinese martial arts maintain some traces of their own secret society origins. But I mean, there's even things like, like how you do your salutes, right? Different salutes, that different, you know, Hung Ga will do like the tiger paw, right? Shaolin will often just do one hand because the uh, first disciple of Bodhidharma cut out his arm. I mean, there's this whole codification. It's almost like a Masonic handshake. The dances were often performed before or even during battle. The Maori Haka dance, for example, while not explicitly an animal form, is a fight line routine. And so similarly, these animal societies might have performed their dances on the fight line too, almost like a breakdancing taunt. So when a battle was coming up, a Native American bear clan might have acted like bears and an Australian Aboriginal might have acted like a kangaroo or an emu. But when it came time to actually fight, the bear people didn't start pawing at their enemies. The emu people didn't start pecking at their opponents and the kangaroo people didn't start hopping around. They used weapons for that. The Australian Aborigines fought with weapons, not animal martial arts. Same with Africans, same with Native Americans. In fact, I would venture to guess that you might even offend somebody if you implied that they used animal movements in combat because these movements were first and foremost for ritual purposes. So you could say that these were animal martial arts styles by virtue of the clan designating the animal as its totem, but the resemblance stops at the ritual level, and their weapon-based warfare bears little resemblance to the animal movements themselves. And if you also look at Chinese animal systems, often they have weapon forms that don't really look like their empty-handed animal forms as well. When looking at the empty-handed Seven Star Mantis crushing step form, for example, you can see a lot of mantis aesthetics. But the Seven Star Sword routine within Mantis seems to have none of the obvious Mantis flavor. There's also the Crane Staff form, and I guess you could say that these embody what would be the spirit of the animal, but that almost seems like they would have been the first version of the martial arts of these animal styles. And the empty-handed aesthetics might have had a different purpose at first. So this brings me to the second aspect of animal dances, shamanism. The Arunta of Central Australia would perform their totem dance called an Intichuma, which promoted the creation of more of that totem. The kangaroo dance, for example, would make more kangaroos, presumably for eating. Although not necessarily by them, because that was their totem animal, which made it taboo, and so they would make it for other clans. It's a long story. I recommend reading Fraser's Totemism and Exogamy for more information about this. But in general, these dances had many shamanistic purposes. They would use them for mitigating floods, plagues, famines, infertility, or ghosts, or they were done during new moons, solstices, and other festivals. So could it be that at least some of these Chinese animal movements were originally for shamanistic purposes, no different than lion and dragon dances? Might these have started as ritual dance systems and later on adopted their martial qualities? And other Chinese animal arts retain a vestige of their shamanistic origins too. This southern tiger style has a rain routine. Is this to mimic rain or is it to conjure rain? Or the various movements from the snake style, which has effective ice strikes, but how about the delayed death touch or dim mak? Was this originally meant as an attack or did it originally have a medicinal purpose and then later on became acupuncture? Now we go to the medicinal arts. Scalpel in hand of novice, killer. Scalpel in hand of expert, 
surgeon, right? There's this old thing of it says medicine is poison, right? So with intention and dosage, your poison can become medicine. And so over time, we're learning this low level communication of martial arts. And we're learning how to kill and how to punch and how to good and fall and how to be sloppy and gross and low level. And then over time, that punch is healing. When you're good, you don't hit them, you heal them. And looking at the name Seven Star Mantis, what does Seven Star mean exactly? Though Mantis Systems will demonstrate their competence and application, if this system was originally for the purposes of astrology, could Seven Star refer to the Seven Stars of Ursa Major? Could these forms be some kind of physical astrology? Perhaps they were done during festivals, just like a lion or dragon dance. When looking at other native animal systems, these animal clans also designated whom you could marry. If your system was exogamous, as most were in their early stages, you had to marry outside of your clan. So if your clan totem is tiger, you can't marry a tiger. You might have to marry a crane, for example. And once enough of these intermarriages happen, the clans might just fuse together into one clan, a tiger crane clan. Now, if we look at Hongkun, a Chinese animal martial arts system that combines tiger and crane animal movements, some lineages trace its origin to Hong Hei Gong, a tiger practitioner who trained with Fong Wing Chun, a crane practitioner. He learns crane style from her, avenges her father's death. The two get married and create a hybrid tiger crane system, which becomes Hongkun, the style of Wang Fei Hong. Without denying the efficacy or the lineage of Hongkun, is it possible that the tiger and crane styles were actually originally clan affiliations of the male and female who founded the system, which were then fused into one clan with this marriage, and that later on these movements would be integrated into one curriculum? Now, before anybody thinks I'm disparaging Chinese animal styles, hear me out. The currently accepted martial lineages of animal styles are sometimes legitimate, and they make for some crazy powerful styles that sometimes shock MMA guys with their utility in the ring. And the stories of these martial art masters escaping persecution into southern China and overseas lend additional legitimacy to these arts. Then we had the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution is, if you look that up at any point, it is just horrific. Anybody who stole, studied anything that was considered of old, uh, whether it was in the martial arts or, I mean, vase making or bone arrow making, I mean, you were just eradicated. That's when it caused a lot of people to want to leave for sure. Like my old teachers and whatnot, you know, why we have it in America now, they just had to get out. These people were heroes and faced insane odds and nobody's denying this. But we should always be willing to ask the question, if animal clan membership operates in one way everywhere else in the world, why would it operate any differently in China? And I think that this helps us understand the aesthetics of Chinese animal art styles and Chinese styles overall in a broader context beyond simply being self-defense techniques. Their roots are far deeper and far more interesting. Because if we go on thinking that these animal styles originated with people copying animal combat techniques and using them during human combat, then when we see a guy doing duck kung fu, are we really supposed to believe that somebody learned how to fight from a duck? Because those things are terrible at fighting. And this kind of thinking becomes mockery. I mean, even kung fu movies poke fun at this. But if shamanism was at the root, maybe they didn't do the duck style to defend themselves. Maybe they had weapons for that. And the duck style was instead designed to bring rain or stop a flood or just make more ducks so that people could eat, who knows? Not that you even have to agree that this shamanism actually works, but it helps us understand why people are moving this way. And if shamanism is at the root of these animal styles, then that actually lends a level of credibility because over thousands of years, these styles rode that careful line between aesthetic shamanism and practicality. And here again, we see that Chinese martial arts has a monopoly since no other tribe's animal styles were ever allowed to advance to this level. They were always taken over by other tribes or colonists. But Chinese masters didn't let their animal styles die out. They just continued to encode them. And perhaps this was due to a catastrophic failure of shamanism during the Boxer Rebellion, which I'll cover in the Hot Weapons section next. Now, all of this said, there's no recent evidence of animal totem clans in China, but absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And here's one more reason to consider this animal totem theory that I'm proposing. And it's something that I keep coming back to with the Chinese style, which we can't seem to escape. When you conceptualize your martial art as a system of aesthetics with ritual origins, it frees you to design movements outside the scope of mere application. You get to do radical stuff that looks awesome. And isn't that more in keeping with the Hong Kong and Chinese movement style?
The counterpart to cold weapons are hot weapons, or guns. Guns aren't new to China. In fact, firearms have been in China for at least a thousand years. The Song Dynasty saw the introduction of gunpowder and simple firearms. The 15th century Ming Dynasty opened with the introduction of additional firearms training. By 1729, 60% of the Qing military had firearms, and by the end of the 19th century, cold weapons were all but replaced by these hot weapons. The firearm was one of many factors which led to widespread change in China, but it was a major factor. The Boxer Uprising saw the formation of an anti-imperialist organization called the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists, which convinced its members, unfortunately, that talismans could protect them from weapons. And so thousands of traditionally minded patriotic Chinese ran straight into foreign gunfire and lying riddled with bullet holes realized that they had been duped. Their talismans failed them. After the embarrassing fall of the boxers, which came in the wake of many other losses against Westerners, there was a heartfelt desire for change within Chinese martial arts. Huo Yunjia responded to the sick men of Asia taunts and opened the Jingwu Academy, a YMCA-like establishment where anybody could come in and take martial arts. The organization wanted to be more scientific and progressive and distanced itself from the superstitious martial arts that had been the downfall of the boxers, aligning itself with Western exercises like basketball and football, and it laid the foundations for a new second Particularized martial arts system that would later become Wushu. Around the same time, in 1912, the Beiping Physical Culture Research Institute is established to promote secularized Taiji Chuan, divorced of its spiritual properties, promoted now as a healthy exercise. Sun Lutong is quoted as saying that anybody who wants to fight should just go get a gun. And Lu Xun says that boxing is pointless now that people have guns. Traditional Chinese martial arts seems to have been dealt a major blow by firearms, and one might have expected guns to replace cold weaponry in mass society. But unlike in America, where firearms had experienced a slow assimilation within society and held a unique position as a diviner of truth in the case of a duel such as the one which killed Hamilton, and its iteration with the revolver in the West, foreign firearms flooded China in the 1860s, allowing civilians to suddenly arm themselves, which also rapidly altered the social fabric and demanded a dynamic response from the state. Whether it was the Qing, the nationalists, or the communists, the Chinese state always sought to utilize an armed populace to gain power and then clamp down on those gun rights to regain its monopoly on violence. And revolutionary cinema wasn't afraid of depicting the value of firearms, in the interests of the party, of course, and the depiction is kind of realistic. Compare this to Hong Kong, where the situation was much more stable. In keeping with the Crown possessions, gun ownership in Hong Kong was tightly constrained to military, police, and a very tiny portion of the civilian population who could afford the permit. Nevertheless, the likes of John Woo and Johnny Toe, inspired no doubt by spaghetti westerns and American blockbusters, made highly cinematic gun scenes, creating an entire genre called bullet ballet, with strong poses and montage editing, which helped to tell a story that would otherwise be impossible to tell. Reality in bullet ballet takes a back seat to entertainment value. But uh, that wasn't the only bullet ballet. Chinese revolutionary theater literally had bullet ballets as well. Hong Kong cinema in the south and revolutionary cinema just north of that had fully adopted firearms into their cinematic vocabularies, one to sell tickets, the other to legitimize a party. They would go on to form their own cinematic languages with firearms. But this hasn't stopped the production of traditional martial art films. The two action languages seem to be thriving side by side. So long as there is gunpowder to be made, and forges to be fired, there will be guns, and hot weapons will continue to inspire Hong Kong and Chinese action cinema. Cold weapons, internal styles, external styles, animal forms. We've barely scratched the surface when it comes to the martial roots of the Hong Kong and Chinese style, but what seems to underlie the older forms is an ancient system of shamanism, perhaps the same shamanism that Yu the Great utilized when he supposedly mitigated the flood crisis and created the world, dancing the Luoshu diagram while dressed as a bear. Was the bear his clan totem? Does the Seven Star Mantis point to the same bear, Ursa Major, in the sky? Whatever the origins of these ancient arts, they all lend themselves to a cooperative movement style with an emphasis on shapes, often with some vestige of the magical systems which created them. But once firearms entered the equation, the martial art masters had to make a decision, either seek refuge abroad or in Hong Kong to write a new chapter in their style's tradition, or abandon the tradition entirely, pick up a firearm, and join the revolution, waiting for the day to renew the art in a highly secularized form approved by the state. It's for this reason that it's so difficult to unpack the true history of Chinese martial arts. 
but we have to ask the questions, even if we don't have the answers. There's a second part to the story of Yu the Great. His famous stepping motions, the Lu Bu, would be reenacted by the Fang Xiang Shi, a Chinese exorcist who would use the steps to exorcise tombs. But his role wouldn't be limited to tombs. He would become a key figure in the Hong Kong and Chinese movement style through a very important art form known as Chinese opera. <laughs> Be sure to join my Telegram channel at t.me slash ericjacobus where you can request action breakdowns for my live streams. My website ericjacobus.com has my written material and my action design and motion capture company is at superalloyinteractive.com. Thanks. <laughs>